It's a good week to read from the book of Job. Because Job stares down suffering and refuses to look away. It's a good week to read from the book of Job. I'll admit that this thought first crossed my mind while I was standing in the Smith's pharmacy line for two hours this week. <laughs> two hours of my one wild and precious life spent in that line, which provided ample time to meditate with Job on the problem of suffering <laughs> and of how a good God allows bad things to happen. Of course, I'm mostly joking. Long lines are frustrating and inconvenient, sure, but in recent weeks, we've experienced more than that. We've experienced and witnessed suffering that is truly tragic and feels unredeemable. Parents bury a child. A gunman opens fire in a school or at a vigil on Halloween. Diseases and disasters, natural and unnatural, tear our loved ones, loved ones from us far too soon. And we, like Job, shake our fists at the sky and cry out, God, where are you? And what are you doing? Maybe you're familiar with Job's story, maybe not. The book of Job is an old fable that begins with God and Satan sitting down and looking down from heaven at a man called Job. God marvels at how faithful Job is, but Satan says that is only because Job has a prosperous and easy life. So they make a bet. God turns Job over to Satan to do whatever they want. And they will see when life gets hard, if Job changes his ways and curses God. Yes, this story is incredibly problematic. It's a fable. It's meant to make a point. And if this description of God makes you uncomfortable or indeed repulsed, then yes, you're reading it right. So God hands the reins over to Satan, the devil, who promptly takes away everything good in Job's life. His children die. His property is destroyed by war and fire. His wife turns on him. His friends and family desert him. Even Job's health fails. And he is left, covered in sores, sitting alone on a heap of ashes. Three friends come to Job, ostensibly to comfort him, but all they do is blame him for this predicament that he's gotten himself into. Surely he must have done something to deserve such terrible misery. Job refuses to curse God, so I guess God wins that cruel bet. But he does insist that he is innocent, that his suffering is unmerited, and of course we know that Job is right. Job continues to demand an audience with God so that he can argue his case, that he is blameless. 38 chapters of poetry in, God finally grants Job that audience. God responds, but not with any answer to the problem of suffering. Instead, God wows Job with the majesty of creation, with the inner workings of the universe. God says, did you create this world? Can you make the sun rise in the morning, the stars dance in the night? Then who are you to question my knowledge, my justice, the order of my creation? Somehow this answer satisfies Job. Honestly, I have no idea why. But he repairs.
notes and says he has been meddling in things above his pay grade. At the end of the story, God vindicates Job and reverses his fortune. He gives Job a brand new happy life with better health, twice as much wealth, and even more children. His wife and friends and family all come back and they live happily ever after, right? If you find this story utterly unsatisfying, well, I think that's the whole point. What I find most frustrating and somehow most refreshing about the book of Job is that it simply refuses to answer the question of why we suffer, a question that no answer could really ever satisfy. So it is in the middle of this whole mess of inexplicable suffering, bad friends, and non-answers that Job utters those words that Dennis read for us this morning. I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side. My eyes will behold it, and not another. A bold confession of faith from a man who by all appearances has no reason. Now, I hate it when I have to burst the bubble of the late great George Friedrich Handel, but I have to say it, Job is not talking about Jesus. The book of Job was written down about 600 years before the birth of Christ, and the fable itself is truly probably much older than that. So sure, from this side of the resurrection, we Christians may read the story of Jesus into Job's words, and that's all well and good. But when Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, he is not referring to some future dude named Jesus. <laughs> no, Job is talking about a Redeemer. The Hebrew word is goel, and it's actually a legal term. For ancient Israel. Redeemer means next of kin. The Redeemer is a family member, an advocate, someone who can take up your cause if you fall into trouble. Legally, a Redeemer can buy you back if you get sold into slavery, or they can buy back the family land if you sold it off to pay debts. A redeemer can actually even legally go out and avenge your murder. So watch out, Satan. A redeemer is someone in your family who in the end has got your back. I know that my redeemer lives, says Job. Really? Who? All of Job's children are dead. Just before this morning's reading, earlier in the same chapter, Job has proclaimed, my relatives and close friends have failed me. The guests in my house have forgotten me. My breath is repulsive to my wife. My intimate friends abhor me. Even my servants count me a stranger. Job has no next of kin, no redeemer, no family. Job is all alone in his suffering. There is no one to plead Job's case, nobody who has got Job's back. Yet still Job stands on the ash heap and proclaims, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand at the last day, and I will see God face to face. Job refuses to abandon hope. 
Job knows he has no friends or family, but he calls out for family anyway. It's a good week to read the book of Job because today we celebrate All Saints Sunday. Now, unlike some flavors of Christianity, Presbyterians don't have a special category of people that we call saints. Instead, we profess that we are all saints, just as we are all sinners. For what is a saint but a sinner who has been forgiven? A sinner who is doing the best they can. Which means that the saints we lift up this morning are not just good people, but God's people. The good, the bad, and everything in between. And it's not just those who have died, but it's the saints that are still living. So you, and you, and me. Those early Christians who wrote down the Apostles' Creed called the church the communion of saints. And they called one another brother, sister, sibling, child. These saints, these forgiven sinners, formed what the scholars have called an alternate kinship system, what the queer community today calls chosen family. The church became a place where, contrary to the popular saying, water is, in fact, thicker than blood. For in the waters of baptism, we are all family to one another. Job is looking for his family. Maybe you are too. Well, friends, look around. This is your family. Look at the people next to you. Really, do it. These are your next of kin, your redeemers. If you are in need, if you fall into trouble, these are the people who will drop things and help you. Here is your family, the communion of saints. One of you said it perfectly this week. I was talking to a church member who will remain unnamed who was dealing with some cold weather plumbing and electric difficulties that threatened to leave them without heat on one of these deep freeze nights that we've been having. And I started to say my usual spiel, if you can't get the heat back on, the church can help. Many of us have a guest room, we can put you up in a hotel. If you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out. To which this member cut me off and responded, oh, don't worry. I have my church directory and I know how to use it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that I have family, and that family will not let me spend a night in the cold. Job knows that his Redeemer lives. He's right, of course. It's you. It's me. It is every one of us who reaches out our hand when someone is in need. So family of saints, let us stand up and be redeemers to one another, this and every day. For then in our flesh and blood, here on this earth, we shall see God. Amen. Amen.